Hey guys, welcome back to Pillbox Movies. I'm Hank, and today we're going to be watching the 1934 French film La Chienne. 1934? 1931. God damn it. I figured I can't do a video on Scarlet Street. I've already seen it, so let's do one on La Chienne. Uh, Scarlet Street is a remake of La Chienne, which is itself an adaptation of a play of the same name by André Moisy Aon which is also an adaptation of a novel by Georges de la Fouchardière. Uh, the movie is directed by Jean, Jean Renoir. Truth be told, truth be told, I have never seen a full Jean Renoir film. I have never watched a Jean Renoir film to completion. Astounding. I know. I, I plan to change that before 2020 ends or into 2022. I plan to change that in 2022. We have a lot of genre noir films in the in the pipeline ready to go. Um, but I'll just say as a as a preamble, I am not familiar with genre noir's work. There will probably be a lot of speculation in this movie as to his aesthetic, his practice best practices, his design elements, and they will probably be wrong. <laughs> uh, Jean Renoir is considered one of the great, great auteurs of filmmaking, of French filmmaking, obviously. I think um, some important French filmmaker probably once said that um, all French film, all French filmmakers are the, ch are the children of Jean Renoir and... Robert Bresson, yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a hefty kind of that's a hefty charge to make. I'm already very familiar with the plot of La Chienne. It's about a like a frustrated day worker and aspiring artist who, by random acts of chance, meets a sex worker who uh, charms him into committing increasingly desperate acts uh, to win her affections. Which is like you know, story of story of everybody's life, story of all men's lives, I guess, at a certain point in their life. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in taking my first foray into Jean Renoir, dipping my toes once again into that vast and deep pool of French filmmaking. So yeah, let's do that. And before we begin, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more old, obscure, and art house films. I have a Patreon if you're interested, and. Um, yeah. Mesdames et messieurs, <laughs> nous allons avoir l'honneur de représenter devant vous un grand drame social. Mesdames et messieurs, n'écoutez pas ces braves gens. La pièce que nous allons vous montrer n'est ni un drame ni une comédie. Elle ne comporte aucune attention morale. Which goes against the actual design of a Punch and Judy show. I think Fritz Long's did adaptations of two movies that Renoir did. Fritz Long, no chill whatsoever. Écoute, mon vieux le vent, écoute, écoute, mon vieux le vent. Une Paris soirée ne peut pas se terminer comme ça. Mais il n'arrivera pas. I mean, they're both right. And I like the the framing of the uh, the Moulin Rouge windmill in the distance tipping off where they're heading towards they're definitely kind of um, establishing Legrand as a bit of a chump even more so in this than in Scarlet Street he seems he seems like an Eeyore like a casting of a pall on any party he, he joins I am realizing now I'm watching two two features in a row with sex workers and pimps. 
And I wonder if uh, Long, like, deliberately, or just because it's uh, Renoir chose to sh- shoot this in a kind of very stylized, distant way, uh, he chooses to shoot it in the reverse. Long chooses to shoot it in the reverse of Renoir. Renoir shot it from their backs um, in kind of uh, the distance on the left side of the screen. And when Long will shoot this confrontation, he'll shoot it kind of with standard Hollywood block- blocking with them in the in the foreground in, or at like the middle distance facing towards the camera. This is really beautiful composition, though, from Ren- Renoir already. And this is much meeker version of this character than Joan Joan Bennett did obviously paint me Chris Vous êtes contrôleur dans un théâtre Non, je suis je suis artiste peintre. Ah. This is a subtweet if I've ever heard any. I'll definitely say this for long. He definitely kind of inserts the sense of chemistry or thrill into the scene uh, a lot more urgently than Renoir does. But I really love these these shots by Renoir. It's deeply, deeply dark, deeply dynamic, very interestingly foregrounded and backgrounded. Ooh, and I really like that shot choice. Like, keeping kind of the dimensions the same and just like pulling pulling back keeping that stair rail the the center of the shot and just pulling back like what wells would do in the reverse direction for citizen kane it just is it does a good job of pointing you to where his mind is it's really interesting noticing the changes that are made uh, between this and Scarlet Street. It's it's really interesting because Fritz Long is obviously operating in a Hollywood system, so he's kind of obliged to shoot things in a very very Hollywoodish kind of way, and. It's interesting when he make, diverges from that, but this scene, for example, the way that it's shot in in Scarlet Street, it's eye level camera work, and it's just like noticing the subtle differences. Like it's shot at eye level camera, um, camera height, and the picture of uh, his wife's uh, first husband is like this huge portrait that kind of dominates the scene, but it's also like incredibly legible compared to this. It's kind of interesting to see what Renoir kind of prioritizes as um, an artist who is given free reign with the subject, but also he has a kind of like first, he has first rights to it. So while Long is able to do a lot of interesting things with the story, he ha- also still has to do it within the shadow of Renoir and like make conscious choices that either affirm or um deviate from what Renard Renoir did, did first. Like this shot in Scarlet Street, or the setup, the design of this office, it's so huge and sprawling, and it really gives you a kind of sense of how uh confined he is within it, how small of a cog he is within this I'm going to pause for a second. Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, I'm really, really early into this movie, but I'm getting really excited just drawing the comparisons. It's, it's pretty interesting already, the kind of differences that are made. Um, and it's it's also weird to see how kind of like the differences function like on like different fault lines like uh, already i'm getting uh, ideas of how like visually interesting this 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 adaptation is like renoir is like renoir is taking uh profuse liberties with um camera movement with uh darkness and scenes with um 
uh, uh, breaking up the compositions, basically keeping things really dynamic and and visually varied. And while there's like great things in Long's in Long's uh, along Scarlet Street, visually, from what I remember, it does take a very kind of stated. Um, we'll say like in-house design to it that it kind of like obligingly has to follow a kind of uh, a Hollywood uh, studio system idea of familiarity. So the compositions are all like, are all very studio-ish, like things that you would expect um, a studio movie to look like, basically blocking for clarity, having two characters like center, um, like on on two sides of the frame talking to each other at like a at like a medium distance not really getting too much of a sense of geography looking kind of like um looking like it was shot in a set basically and it's funny to see that contrast but also like so that's like arguably like a notch in favor for renoir and conversely in terms of writing uh, I'm obviously not picking up on the uh, subtleties of the French script writing, but in terms of structure, this is like very kind of like fast and elemental, and this the the writing seems to take kind of a, a back seat. It's actually advancing the plot a lot faster than uh, Scarlet Street, and characters are a lot more open with what they're their their feelings or their motivations are and it kind of in some ways replicates the feeling of the punch and judy show of the puppet show that these are characters kind of um coursing through as if on a track as if in alignment with like a commedia and like uh trying to be as clear and obvious as possible whereas in terms of the script writing of scarlet street um uh, I think it's a much longer movie, maybe. It's definitely a longer movie, but there's a lot more breathing room in the script to allow, like, ideas to develop and fester. It was bad enough when you used to copy picture postcards. Well, Utrillo copies postcards, and he's considered a great painter. Next thing you'll be painting women without clothes. I never saw a woman without any clothes. I should hope not. Go ahead and eat, and then do the dishes. This is the happy household hour. As you remember, we left Hilda in the laundry last Did you read this? Read what? Uh, this murder in Queens. A man killed his wife with a window weight. He didn't get away with it, did he? He'll go to the chair as he should. Uh, Adele, you didn't mean what you said about giving my paintings away to the junk man. You'll find out. Well, uh, you won't have to. A friend of mine is taking an apartment in Greenwich Village. Uh, I'll move everything there. Yeah, so like, uh, I'm only 18 or 19 minutes in right now, but I'm just like really excited to see like the differences. And I wouldn't even necessarily call them. It, at this point, I really don't even know if they're directorial differences, like intentional differences on the part of the director, so much as uh, directorial differences made by the director, but based on the context in which they are producing the work, a Renoir kind of as an independent filmmaker in France in the 30s and Fritz Long as like um, a Hollywood filmmaker operating within the studio system in the in in the 40s yeah see this would be a scene that in Scarlet Street would definitely be between Kitty and Chris like uh, that the movie amps up their chemistry really highly in contrast to this so that when she like breaks his confidence it's that much more painful this takes like 40 minutes to an hour in scarlet street he doesn't get her that studio until really late into that movie you'll get plenty of light lots of privacy and they're already having sex in this version. If I were single, if I had no wife, 
But you have a wife. And I'm sure they're going to do this in this version, but by this point in Scarlet Street, they've really amped up like the psychological tension of the financial aspects of their relationship. You're like really, really into the swing of how much of a cost this is for uh, Chris, who has given off the impression that he's like a millionaire painter living in the la la lap of luxury. I like his paintings better than Chris. I love these little camera movements from you, Renoir. Always keeping things active and dynamic. I, I'm gonna have to like disavow myself because I have said earlier, oftentimes that I don't really like camera movement that much in a in a movie, when it's not really contributing to the feeling. But for a static movie like this, it's helpful in keeping things dynamic. And this is also part of the tension that's in Scarlet Street in contrast to this. Like, it doesn't enter, it ne almost never uh, breaches into the territory of their relationship becoming sexualized. It's always kept keeping you waiting and wanting uh, to see them consummate with the knowledge of how disgusted Kitty is by the idea. Very different attitudes uh, between French and, and US over the ideas of infidelity. And in that, the audience's relationship with the character, with a protagonist who can commit infidelity and still be likable, it's like still normal to a French audience and would be pushing the limit too far for an American. It gives it like a creepy kind of, I don't know, like patronly air to it. Renoir has a really interesting style in this movie. It's not at all what I was remembered when I watched Rules of the Game. I mean, I watched Rules of the Game the, the first few scenes, like literally like 15 years ago, but he he operates a camera almost like a documentary, almost like where he doesn't know where the subjects are going to go. Like just catching up to the subject. It's weird to say because it feels like a camera that's addressing a shot or a composition that isn't planned. It feels very kind of improvisational and loose and open, but Clearly, Renoir has ver is very meticulous in planning out these shots and these compositions because there's so much visual interest happening with like things happening in the background, in the foreground, um, different kind of patterns playing against each other, different uh, like line directions happening, all these verticals uh, of the drapery and the wallpaper and then all the horizontals of the linens in the closet and of the brick. Like, from a shot selection, from a uh, production design, art direction uh, perspective, he's very clearly planned all these out, but then shot it in such a way to kind of give you a sense that he hasn't. I really, 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 really want to see if this carries on to his other stuff, because uh, already from the stuff I'm seeing from Le Chien, it's like, it's really different from what I was expecting. I'm already so interested in this movie. It's like so much worse written than Scarlet Street, but visually so, so interesting. Like, there's so many, like, ideas that I'm already getting of Renoir that are really impressing me. Look at this fucking expressionistic set. What the heck is this German expressionism? I can't, I have, I'm having a hard time explaining it, but he really, he does a really good job. Renoir, I'm going to pause. He does like a, he does like a really good job of making sets that 
look like they'll be pretty static or look like um, humdrum or average or just like regular daily places and gives them a lot of vi visual interest, just like where he chooses to place the camera, when he chooses to move it, and uh, just ways he chooses to divide up the screen. This is so... This is such an interesting composition while not choosing to be like a very like obvious or stated composition the way like if you were watching like Kubrick or Wes Anderson or or something something of, of that ilk but without like without like filling up the frame too much adding in elements of like uh, uh, of cutting up the frame of dividing the frame of uh letting your eyes allow to allow your eyes to like wander to different locuses like the uh painting in the background that's being pierced that's being cut up by the uh the window pane the lighting in the middle ground in the in the middle uh uh foyer that's just casting this one shaft of light and then the the foreground and the background being in darkness with little rays of light to highlight things, the shadows that are being cast on, uh, on the backside of the staircase, the, the, the table splitting up that, that verticality, like there's just a lot of cool things happening in what would in a lot of filmmakers approach be a very stale composition or a very stale set. And, and like, <laughs> I don't know. There's just like a suggestion, like a rhythm to it. Like the way that the uh, paintings are like coming in from the left and then kind of receding into the back and then continuing on and just being stopped right there by the staircase. Like your eye is allowed to follow and trace through things. And that kind of trail um, is aided by there being nothing underneath the staircase with that part of the frame being bare. And so there's just a suggestion left. Your eyes are make are, are following in a direction and then left wanting more. There's just, <laughs> Renoir is really skilled. Uh, and uh, I'm like worried that I'm like seeing things that aren't there or that won't present themselves in his other movies. But if this stuff remains consistent or explored or developed upon in his other works, I'm really, really excited. And he backs up into the light. That's great. No, but it's all like it's the Like, what? What filmmaker do you know would shoot something in a hallway and keep your interest visually? And again, when another subject is introduced, the subject of most interest, the camera comes comes in, and the the visual interest of them in this kind of like accordion or this like this this elevation. You know, Renoir is really really talented. That's a beautiful transition. What a beautiful idea. That's all you need for like the to show the transition of time, the passage of time, to show that the the stock of the Clara Wood um, persona is growing. I really love this reframing of the of of the painting. I don't know if it's a painting. It might be a sketch study. Let's let's say it's a painting. But I I I, I love the because we're familiar with it already. It was presented on the floor, frame right, uh, like the bottom right corner of the frame, and now it's presented top left, like elevated, magisterial. Really good ideas that are being utilized in this movie. <laughs> It's so interesting because what I love about Scarlet Street, what I love about this, it was the story and the passion and the acting and the intensity of it and the, like the strong distillation of like primal ideas of love and money and manipulation and like I'm barely interested in any of those things in this version so far it presents the exact same story with completely opposite interests it's just they're literally the opposite films about the exact same subject 
It's like almost the exact opposite of Scarlet Street. Lulu is like the least interesting character in this version, and Kitty is like the most in Scarlet Street. It's all so confusing. And Johnny is like the least interesting character in Scarlet Street, and Dede is the most in this. Look at this camera work, what the heck? This looks like it was filmed in like the mod 60s in like Britain. He's already taking such a, making it such inventive ideas. I, I'm wondering if there were like developments in the camera, in the camera size or the camera weight at this time. And it's conveying the chaos of the characters so well. Look at the composition of this shot! Yo, Jean, was your dad like a painter or something? I like this connection they're making with the art world, though. This is definitely something that's not present in Scarlet Street, but the idea that at, at every level, from the lowest bidders of society to the highest, um, all transactions... All transactions are actually um, laundering for the real transactions, which are sexual. That's like an intensely dark idea that even Scarlet Street isn't re uh, equipped to handle. It's a lot more sweet version of the Lulu Kitty character in this. Like, she's def def in an abusive relationship. God. Dede is rotten to the core in this one. I mean, so is so is Johnny in Scarlet Street, but Dede is really captivatingly grotesque in this version. Like, look at this idea. It seems commonplace now, but shooting from like the outside looking in, making it feel so like creepy and voyeuristic and conspiratorial who's having these ideas in 1931 it feels like jean renoir is a is a documentarian it feels like his lens is a silent observer <laughs> and yet conversely it's so interesting how kind of flat his treatment of dramatic events are in comparison to what Long does, both like individually and uh, within the framework of a Hollywood studio system. Le grand, le grand. <laughs> le grand, oh, beautiful! What a great shot! Jesus Christ! Excusez-moi, madame, de vous appeler familièrement Adèle. C'est une habitude née d'un trop durable malentendu, par suite duquel, madame, nous avons couché plusieurs... Oh, that's ensemble. a great line, though. Ah. I don't really know how to explain what I'm feeling, but I'm loving Renoir's camera work. It feels like a silent and judgmental observer. Oh, une panne d'électricité! <sighs> yeah, he's devious. Buzz-moi. She likes it a little. The characters are drawn a little bit like lighter and looser than the American adaptation, but it allows for some interesting kind of 
moral grays like Legrand delighting in his uh in his plotting or uh <laughs> or or um or Lulu kind of perhaps sexually delighting in uh in Dede Sadism. And in terms of the parallel structure again, uh, I didn't even think about this. Legrand con- uh, conceived of a plot wherein, wherein Adele's husband would would catch them out, and similarly, he's experiencing that now with Lulu and Dede, and a beautiful shot again as the observer from the outside. Just brilliant, brilliant ideas on the part of on the part of Renoir. <laughs> That bug again. It's really... The more I think about it, it's really such an interesting kind of thought experiment to watch these two movies in contrast with each other. They have almost entirely wholly different values, almost intentionally. Just thinking about, like, the way that uh, that Legrand slash Chris's relationship with Lulu slash uh, Kitty is developed around painting between the two. They're so, so different. Like, uh, Legrand has a sexual relationship with Lulu and kind of, like, gives her the paintings as a way to, like, hide them from his wife and as, like, a small reward. And Chris is obsessed with painting Kitty and almost devotes his entire collection to uh, portraits of her and studies of her. There, it, it's just like completely different conceptualizations of the exact same story. I love this idea, though. I really do love this idea. She's going to manipulate him again. Oh, my God. Oh, this is that one step. Oh, my God. That's so beautiful. Uh, This is that one step deeper that I don't think Scarlet Street has that uh, kind of really seals in the culpability of Lulu that she makes the final act she's responsible for the final act of manipulation. Uh, I really like this kind of, uh, this this version where the portrayal isn't, uh, of Legrand, isn't that Lulu is sleeping, isn't that Lulu is sleeping with, with Dede, is that she's tricking him. The, the deception is the thing that finally turns him completely around. And that's something that's true in Scarlet Street too, but it's more connected with her um, her being in cahoots with with uh, with Johnny. I love the iconography of this of this pose. I don't know what to tell you, Legrand. Literally, this just is how it is sometimes. She's laughing at him. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. <laughs> Grotesque. This is a really great climax. Wow. Coppola. Coppola would have loved this. Ooh, and they don't even show it. Ooh. Ooh. Dark, dark, dark. Oh, dark.
Oh, dark! And this is like so Hitchcockian, and like choosing to place the camera at a distance from the violence. Like, because we don't relate to the character anymore. The action is just too intense. This is such, this is such intelligent filmmaking. I'm like, really buzzing. I'm, I'm quite pleased, because this is the best movie I've seen in a long, long time. Oh man, he's gonna catch a bad beat for this. And he, I love that he drives right into the crowd so that everybody sees him. Everybody's a witness. This sucks. He caught a bad rap. Look how far away we are from the emotional fallout of this character. We're just at such a long distance and we have to interpret what's going on in his head from so far away. It's really great. It's really, really great. This is a really, really well-made movie. I love that they're still trying to, like, uh, milk, milk some profits out of her. Out of this literal dead body. The movie is surprisingly cynical. Beautiful shot. I love that he doesn't express any remorse at all, like any sort of <laughs> sadness over her death. He's just concerned about his own fucking culpability. Such an asshole to the end. Oh, and he was rich this entire time. This asshole. Oh, fuck. He's so fucking annoying. I didn't even notice, but I like how they actually have uh, Dede in the, the background of these scenes. And then they, they bring it up closer in this shot. An asshole to the end. I, and I like the idea that uh, the more honest this character is, the more he incriminates himself, despite not being guilty. That is, uh, that is uh, a cynical look as well. Just, just casually holding public ex executions, okay. He really has committed to this life, he avoided his entire life. I wonder if he really intended to have this, like, muted ending, where you can't hear what they're saying, or if the yeah, sounds of traffic were just too intense. I really wonder if, like the, uh... Like the puppet said, if there's really no lesson to be learned from this... Oh, what a great idea! So good! That's such a good idea! Just so imaginative, this production. So many cool looks. Yeah, I wonder if there is really no lesson to be derived from this, other than cruel fate befalls us all. And... 
the closest thing we can do to avoid the major swings is to stay at home as much as possible. <laughs> this is a movie and a story made by somebody. Deathly, deathly afraid of going out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I've made myself clear enough. Like this was so imaginatively and vibrantly filmed. It has almost a completely different uh, trajectory and value system to it than Scarlet Street does. Almost everything this movie does bad, Scarlet Street does intensely, intensely well. Uh, things that are kind of lacking in Scarlet Street are uh, given such free reign and openness in this. It's a really cool companion piece between the two. I think between them, you kind of have a perfect film. And it's, I, 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 I don't want to like, uh, I don't want to speculate on what might not really be there, but to, to me, it feels like a lot of the kind of the, the relative strengths and weaknesses that are produced by both films aren't necessarily so, so much a commentary on the respective strengths and weaknesses of the directors. Although that's present to a certain degree, like you you wouldn't have this movie you wouldn't have Le Chien be as imagistically and compositionally as interesting as it is unless it was filmed by Renoir and you wouldn't have a movie as like kind of dark and malevolent and delicious as Scarlet Street if it wasn't directed by Fritz Lang or or you might, but it wouldn't be communicated as effectively. But I also think this is like an interesting case study in terms of the respective um, industries that produced it and cultures that produced it. I, I, this is this is speaking from a 21st century flattening out perspective on what um, 20th century French and American attitudes are towards what a film is and what um, what purposes it serves commercially artistically culturally but i think you can glean to a certain degree certain uh patterns or um value systems in in the respective cultures based on the relative strengths and weaknesses of the two films i think there are opportunities that are lent to la Chan to be really kind of open and artistic and uh freewheeling that makes it a less dramatic work, but a more artistically uh, artistically curious work. And there are kind of studio and commercial restrictions on Scarlet Street that prevent it from be being as exploratory, being as curious, um, and also being as remote and distant, and instead punch up like the extreme drama of it and the intensity of emotion and feeling and really amp up the sense of titillation and the sense of explosive emotions in the audience. I, lo I look at Scarlet Street and I see like uh, a movie utilizing stars to tell a and, and, and an erotic and harrowing tale. And I see La Chien as using kind of um, players in order to tell a fabulistic story, but one that's so intensely, intensely observed, and one that um, kind of uses the flatness of delivery in order to um, prioritize intensity of images, of icons, of of of, of vision. It, it almost um, you could almost say that the the that the the two movies represent like the two different approaches or attacks on on film as a medium one that treats it as a narrative medium and or um intended to express stories with the kind of roller coaster the um the the development, the the introduction and development and twist and climax and denouement of a Western narrative story, and the other approach, which is imagistic and experimental, and isn't doesn't necessarily rely on film as a movie that expresses itself or is retained by an audience through the telling of a fascinating story, so much as a movie that hypnotizes an audience with arresting images and uses the power of juxtaposition 
more so than than story and uh, rising action uses a vocabulary of images to creep into an audience and to uh, um, offer things for their senses, for their tactile experience, for their um, sensorial experience in order to lock itself into their hearts and their imaginations and their memories. It's a really interesting contrast in movies. Really, really interesting. I feel like I'm I'm a servant of two masters right now fighting, and I, I don't want to see mom and dad fight. <laughs> They're both really good. They're both really, really, really good. And you'll you'll like one or the other based on your tastes, obviously. But apart from your tastes, in terms of what is instructive about the movies, they're both really, really good. So yeah, you should definitely check out La Chien if you haven't seen it before. And if you enjoyed this video, click the like button and subscribe if you haven't before. I don't know why you wouldn't. We watch so many good movies on this channel. If you're into weird shit, if you're into uh, unknown shit, if you'd like to hear about and talk about movies in a really, in, in more of a nuts and bolts way, really talk about what movies are made of and what they make you feel, this is a channel for you. I don't need to tell you. I'm preaching to the choir here. You just watched a full move. You you just watched a full ass YouTube video on La Shed. What? Good for you. I'm proud of you if you made it to the end of this video because I really love this movie. And if you made it to the end of this video, I feel like you got to feel a little bit passionate about movies. You just watched a video on La Shed. I'm happy for you, man. I'm happy for you. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> that was La Shed. I'm buzzing. I'm juiced up to the gills. Go watch La Chien. And until next time, keep watching good movies. So, 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 so good. So, 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 so good. So good. <laughs>